Hello and welcome to the first installment of Brady's Dynamic Lecture Series covering chest and abdominal trauma. It will cover the assessment, treatment, transport, and emergency room care of a patient who presents with various chest or abdominal traumas. View the program in its entirety, then log on to the Online Training Academy and complete the corresponding exam. If you have any questions regarding the program, please contact Lieutenant Jason Harmson or Sergeant Trent Baker. Let's get into it. Chest and abdominal trauma, case one. You, a paramedic, and your partner are dispatched to a possible stabbing. What are some of your immediate concerns? Well, at this point in time, you're probably worried about the number one thing, which is seeing safety. Uh, this is a call that we run fairly often here in the county, and we have a pretty good relationship with PD and with the dispatchers giving us adequate information in, in most cases when it comes to this stuff. Uh, that would be your primary concern, just is the scene safe? You do not want to walk in on something that is going on at the time. You also want to ensure that not only are PD on scene, but that the scene is secured. Uh, sometimes dispatch will say PD is on scene. That does not mean they've got control of the situation, so you want to ensure that that's happening. You also want to, in your mind at least, start preparing yourself. You got dispatched to a stabbing. You know, start thinking about the critical things. Where is the stab wound? You know, how bad is it? Is it one stab wound? Is it several? Uh, do I have multiple patients? And you want to start preparing yourself mentally as you're going to this call. When asked, your dispatcher reports that the police are en route. Right? There again, they're en route. It's not a secured scene until you hear this secure. You arrive on the scene to find three police units outside. An officer meets you at the curb and informs you that the scene is safe and there's one patient in the house with a stab wound to the chest. All right, what equipment will you bring into the house with you? Two different modes of thinking with this. You can bring the whole bus with you, theoretically, you know, to take care of this situation. Uh, you know, you'll have all your treatment options at your fingertips right there in the house. The other option and one that I would side with in a lot of cases is speed is of the essence. Take what you need, the rest is in the truck. At this point, you definitely want to bring a jump kit. You definitely want to bring O2. Uh, monitor, it's a toss up, whether you need it or not. Any suction, possibly, if it involves the airway. Uh, I think at the minimum, you'll bring a jump kit in O2, though. Your initial impression of the patient he presents is sitting on the floor in the kitchen. He's conscious and alert. He's pale and diaphoretic, and he states that he was stabbed in the chest. All right, what's your initial impression of this? Well, it's, it's pretty obvious, as with a lot of trauma. He's stabbed in the chest. All right, a lot of vital organs in the chest cavity. Anywhere you're stabbed in the upper torso can be a cause for concern. Uh, your initial impression should be that this is a possibly a severe trauma and that you need to possibly load and go with this patient. What are your next most immediate actions? Uh, you can go a lot of ways with that. You know, uh, me personally, I would disrobe to find out exactly where and how many times he's been stabbed, uh, the depth of the stab wounds. I'd also start asking questions, as many as I could get from him at that time. You don't know if this patient will go unconscious later. You don't know if he'll be have an altered mental status later. I try to get as much accurate as information as I could as quickly as I could. Okay, your partner administers oxygen as you perform an initial assessment. The patient's chest is exposed. When you're performing an exam, the patient states that he was stabbed once in the chest by an unknown male assailant. There's no other trauma. He was not hit in the head. He ran one block to his home. He is weak and dizzy and cannot catch his breath. Right, remember the rant running one block to his home comes into play a little bit later. Right, you note that the airway is open. Breathing's rapid. There is jugular vein distension. However, the lungs are clear and equal. Uh, this may throw you off a little bit. Uh, in a lot of cases, you may suspect tension pneumothorax. Uh, however, you don't have signs and symptoms pointing you that way. Radio pulse is weak and rapid. Skin's cool, diaphoretic, and pale. Has your initial impression changed? Why or why not? 
It quite possibly has. Uh, stab wound to the chest, thoracic cavity, you're thinking pneumothorax a lot of times. Uh, due to the lungs, and the lungs take up a lot of space in the chest cavity. Uh, we see tension pneumothorax a lot more often than other potential injuries. So you may have been headed that way. However, like I said before, keep your mind open about everything until you get all the information possible. What specific injury do you think the patient has suffered? At this point, it's, it's a little bit difficult to say. Uh, you've got the basic information, but you need to continue. All right. You also note a single stab wound just to the left of the sternum in the fifth intercostal space. There's no additional trauma to, lateral, to the lateral or posterior chest, the trachea is midline. Now just because the trachea is midline does not discount a tension pneumothorax. If you recall, tension pneumothorax will cause tracheal deviation, but also remember that's a late sign in a tension pneumothorax, and you just got to this patient. The hole is covered with an occlusive dressing. And with this dressing, uh, you can use a Vaseline gauze wrapper, uh, you can use, uh, I mean, even saran wrap, a uh, tegaderm with a piece of tape put on the sticky side so that you have a one-way valve there. There are several different ways of managing this. Just uh, really your creativity is your only, only uh, stumbling block on this. Vital signs, heart rate's 124 and regular, respiratory rate is 24, blood pressure's 84 over 50, and your O2 sats is 97% on 15 liters per minute of oxygen. Uh, really the only ones that jump out at you, I mean the heart rate's a little high, respiratory rate's a little elevated, but the blood pressure is significantly low, and that's a significant finding. Do you stay in ALS the patient or do you initiate rapid transport? I would say this is a load and go situation. Uh, you've obviously got a stab wound, uh, it's in the chest. You have a low blood pressure that you know, you're investigating right now trying to figure out what's going on. But obviously something is happening, something significant happened. And the only way it's going to get fixed is not in an ER, not on the scene, but in an operating room. You want to get there as quickly as possible. What type of facility does this patient require? Well, I would take them to a level one trauma center. Uh, Grady is a level one trauma center around here. AMC is also a great option. What are your next most immediate actions? Uh, we're going to continue on with this. Uh, another thing to think about as far as assessing someone who's stabbed like this is take a look at the knife itself if possible. Uh, it's going to be evidence in a, in a crime you know, investigation. But if you're able to visualize the knife, see what kind it is, see how big it is, see where the blood smears are on the knife itself. In a lot of situations, especially this is a single stab wound, you can see how far up the knife the blood smear actually goes. It could possibly give you an indication of how deeply it was, you know, the knife was penetrated. You and your partner quickly discuss the situation and decide to not perform spinal immobilization and initiate rapid transport to a level one trauma center eight minutes away. Um, the not performing spinal immobilization I tend to agree with. Uh, it is an isolated wound. It's to the chest. Uh, most likely did not involve any kind of spinal trauma. And also remember they ran a block to get away from the, from the scene. So any kind of uh, C-spine precautions you would have taken are kind of out the window at this point after him sprinting for a, for a block. Patient is placed on a stretcher and moved to the ambulance. You ask your partner to start transport to the hospital. This is something that I've noted on a lot of recent calls that's not being done on average. Uh, seems that a lot of folks are getting preoccupied with getting their IVs taped down just right, that you know, the head blocks are perfect, that the patient is perfectly you know, in line on the board. A lot of times the situation is going to dictate your actions and dictate the level of care you can perform. Um, it is more important, it shows a sign of better judgment to show up to the hospital as quickly as possible 
as opposed to having that pretty IV or that perfect immobilization. There is a time and a place for all that. A situation like this, he needs to get to the hospital quick. All right, reassessment reveals that the patient's conscious and alert, the airway's open, and the lungs are still clear bilaterally. All right, your secondary set of vital signs. Heart rate's 126, it's still up there. Respiratory rate's 26. Blood pressure's 80 over 62, it's still low. All right, your O2 sats of 96% on 15 liters per minute of oxygen. So the heart rate's a little elevated, respiratory rate's a little elevated, that blood pressure's significantly low though. You need to consider that. Right, what's your next most immediate actions? Well, let's see what they do. Patient is placed on the cardiac monitor and a large bore IV is initiated. Blood pressure is low, we need to do an infusion. All right, cardiac rhythm, the interpretation, uh, most likely this is going to be sinus tac. Uh, it doesn't appear to have anything just jumping out at you. Uh, it's, a, it's like a pretty standard strip, just a little bit on the fast side. Does this patient require fluid volume administration? Why or why not? I would say definitely. At least a 500 cc bolus initially, just see if it works. Uh, if it does work, you've solved that problem, or at least you've, you've managed that problem for the moment. If it doesn't work, you know you're dealing with a serious bleed internally. What are your next most immediate actions? Let's see. Fluid bolus administration is initiated. An additional large bore IV is initiated. ETA is one minute. The airway is open, respirations are adequate. The lungs are clear bilaterally. 500 cc fluid bolus is administered and afterwards your vital signs are 112 heart rate regular, respiratory rate's 26. So they're holding fairly steadily, the heart rates come down a little bit. BP's still low, 82 over 62. And the O2 sats are 96% on 15 liters per minute oxygen. Is your treatment having any, any effect? Explain. Well, it, heart rate went down a little, but it really hasn't done what we intended for it to do, which was to raise the blood pressure. What are your next most immediate actions? But if nothing else, you need to be thinking, what am I dealing with here? You know, I'm doing the appropriate you know, treatments for what's going on. I'm treating, the, I'm treating the vital signs, but nothing's changing. You need to start alternating your thinking expanding your, your index of suspicion. You continue fluid bolus administration as you're backing up to the ED. The patient is ready for transfer. The ABCs are evaluated. Patients left on a non-rebreather mask. Echocardiogram confirms the presence of a cardiac tamponade. And an ultrasound guided pericardiocentesis is performed. Pericardiocentesis is where you actually introduce a needle into the pericardial sac of the heart to remove excess fluid. Uh, we'll get into that in a few slides from here. 175 cc's of blood is removed from the pericardium. The patient has then transported to surgery. Thoracotomy in a pericardial window is performed. And a right ventricular wall repair is performed. All right, a little bit of review material in case one. Pericardial tamponade occurs in 2% of all penetrating trauma to the chest and abdomen. It's also rare in blunt chest trauma. It usually has something to do with penetration. Knife, bullet wound, whatnot. Uh, more often with the knife. Mortality is near 100% when untreated. Penetration causing tamponade most often happens in the right ventricle 42% of the time and they go downhill from there. The left ventricle is 33%, right atrium is 15, left is 6, and intrapericardial great vessels are 3%. A mechanism of injury that would lead to cardiac tamponade, 89% of it, of the uh, pericardial tamponades we run into are stab wounds to the heart. 20% of gunshot wounds to the heart. Uh, the reason it's a smaller number with the gunshot wound is because massage hemorrhage occurs due to the larger wound. It, uh, it doesn't allow for the pericardial sac to actually stay intact and, and uh, contain that, that blood that's leaking out of the heart. Alright, just a little bit of review over where the heart's located. 
It's posterior to the sternum, directly behind it. It's anterior to the spinal column, directly in front of it. It's between the lungs, above the diaphragm, and about two-thirds left of the midline of the body. It's within the mediastinum. So now we've got it located. Pericardium is an inelastic, which means non-stretchy. It does not stretch. An inelastic sac surrounding the heart. There are two layers to it. There's a fibrous layer, which is connective tissue and anchors the heart and the entire deal here to the surroundings. And there's a serous layer. It's an interior layer. It folds over itself to produce two layers and a potential space. The serous pericardium. Exterior is a parietal, interior is a visceral. Okay, the space in between these two is filled with 15 to 20 cc's of serous fluid. This allows frictionless movement of the heart within the thorax. Basically, in layman's terms, there's, there's two sacs that cover the, cover the heart. There's the parietal and the visceral pericardium. All right. What these two do is they've got a lubricant in between so that as the heart expands and contracts, it allows free movement. It allows these surfaces to slide along each other without causing any friction. And there's a picture of it. A picture of the different sacs, the different types. Right, and we do not have an animation. And in this picture of the myocardium is penetrated. It's hard to see on that right hand one. They've got them opened up pretty good. I was trying to show you where the blood's collected. All right, blood escapes from the heart into the pericardium. It collects between the visceral and parietal pericardium, what I was talking about, those two layers that allow the heart to expand and contract and slide along each other without any kind of friction. The pericardial sac then fills with blood. Okay, so basically what's happening is blood is escaping the heart, but it's still being contained around the heart due to this sac that's around it. Only 50 to 150 cc's of blood is required for hemodynamic instability and hypotension. All right, the pressure increases in the pericardium. Okay? Because this is an inelastic sac, it can't expand, so the pressure goes in and it compresses the heart. Uh, the diastolic, or the pressure at rest on the veins and vascular system, increases. The ventricular filling decreases. Okay, as the heart is being squeezed down, it's got less space to move in. Venous pressure rises. The reason this happens is the the heart has a decreased amount of cardiac, you know, cardiac con not contractility, but it's got a, dis a decreased amount of space it can expand and contract. So blood is starting to back up. This develops JVD, jugular vein distension. The diastolic pressure rises because the ventricle cannot relax against increasing car pericardial volume. Cardiac output decreases. Obviously, as the heart is being squeezed into the space, it can't, it can't beat as efficiently as it does. The systolic pressure decreases and the pulse pressure narrows. Now, how this happens is that the heart beating out through the ventricles, it's beating out at a decreased pump uh, space. It doesn't have as much space to actually give a good pump through the body. Uh, at the same time, it's backing up because it can't take in as much blood as it used to. Right? An obstructive shock develops. And what obstructive shock is, is a physical obstruction of the great vessels. Okay? So something's blocking it. What it is, is the heart itself just cannot pull in enough blood to keep things going at a normal pace. All right, suspect pericardial tamponade in all penetrating trauma to the chest and abdomen. Early recognition and treatment are critical. Death can occur in as little as five minutes. So we're dealing with a very, very uh, potentially deadly condition. Okay, Beck's triad is one of your clinical findings possibly with the cardiac tamponade. JVD, narrow pulse pressure, and muffled heart sounds. These are the things you're looking for. The JVD, or jugular vein distension, is due to a decreased venous return and an increased venous pressure. All right. well, basically what this means is your heart's not pumping out as much as it should to the body 
because it's being squeezed. It's, it's got a smaller area to work in. At the same time, it's not taking in the same amount of blood to pump out. So it's backing up and it's causing that the veins to stick out or you know, distend. That's the name, jugular vein distension. A narrowing pulse pressure. Okay, this one's a little complicated, not too bad. Decreased cardiac output is equal to decreased systolic pressure. Basically what this is, systolic is the top number, the, the heart at, you know, during the beat cycle when it's actually pumping. All right, the reason it's lower is because there again the pressure on it it doesn't it doesn't have the ability to completely fill and give a complete pump when it's when it's actually compressing therefore it's going to be a lower top number increased venous pressure is increased systolic diastolic pressure sorry what that means is there is a there's a backup of that blood so the pressure that the heart's making when it beats is being held within that venous system and it's increasing because it's not taking the blood in and pumping it out in an equal amount like it should. Now, muffled heart sounds. Remember, a cardiac tamponade, the blood is bleeding. It's coming out of the heart but getting stuck in the sac itself that surrounds the heart. So you're trying to listen to heart sounds, and it's muffled due to that liquid, that blood, that fluid that's in between you and the heart itself when you're listening with a stethoscope. All right. Though a classic presentation for tamponade, Beck's triad is not always present. Okay. Only about one third of the patients have all three signs, and almost 90% will have one or more signs. Uh, as with all EMS, the, these are generalities. Uh, you cannot rely on something just jumping out and, and biting you. I mean, it's, it's really a search and seek type of thing. Uh, you need to use your common sense, use your foundation of education, and read the patient, see what's going on. Keep thinking in your mind, what's going on? What is this? What else could it be? Always keep your mind open to all the situations. Don't ever get tunnel vision into this is what it is and try to fit somebody into a certain category. This has got to be tension pneumothorax because, well, no, it doesn't have to be. So always keep your mind open. All right, here's a clinical assessment of the patient. Trachea is midline. Neck veins are distended. All right. The blood in the sac it compresses the heart and it impedes ventricular filling. Reflex tachycardia tends to but cannot compensate for a low output. Your heart speeds up because it's not pumping out the blood that it needs to. So it says, okay, beat more, but it's not really compensating. Muffled breath sounds, or actually heart tones also. And let's see. And remember those narrow pulse pressures. That's a pretty significant finding. Kussmaul sign. Increased JVD with inspiration. And it's a reliable sign unless hypovolemia exists. Pulsus paradoxus. The blood pressure decreases excessively with inspiration. 12 millimeters or 9%. Okay, more than that. Electrical alternates. Alternating amplitude of ECG complexes. The exact cause is unknown, therefore I don't know. But the heart is swinging in pericardial fluid as they describe it. The excess fluid is acting as an insulator. Okay, so it, basically what's happening is from our lead to the heart itself, there's something in between impeding what we can see or how accurate the, the EKG is. Other signs. Signs and symptoms of shock. Okay, it's the, the end game is tissue perfusion. If you're not getting tissue perfusion, you're going to see signs and symptoms of shock. This will start with shock. This will start showing as shock because we have inadequate volume, pump volume. It's backing up. It's not pumping out as, as it should. It's not getting an adequate volume in, and it's got too much you know, coming back in. Or differentiate from tension pneumothorax. Right. In isolated pericardial tamponade, the lung sounds will be clear and equal bilaterally. The diastolic, diastolic pressure will increase and the trachea will be mid midline. Right. The standard initial treatment is going to be to open and control the airway. Manual maneuvers, endotracheal intubation if necessary, ensure adequate oxygenation and ventilation 
and continuous monitoring with EKG. Fluid administration treatments aimed at increasing the cardiac venous return. Aggressive fluid resuscitation. Trendelenburg positioning. Avoid excessive volumes and high PEEP when providing BVM ventilation. What PEEP stands for is positive end expiratory pressure. All right. You want to be careful of that. All right, and pericardiocentesis, which is the definitive treatment for this. If the patient's in cardiac arrest, obviously CPR and ACLS, and the specific treatments are performed concurrently or at the same time. Pericardiocentesis is a life-saving definitive treatment. Goal is to remove fluid from that sac. It's not supposed to be there, get it out. Uh, relief can be observed with the removal of as little as 20 cc's. The sac can actually hold a pretty significant amount, up to 150, possibly 200 cc's of blood. So, you know, even able to relieve 20 cc's will, will take a significant amount of pressure off of the heart. All right, some of the equipment that you'll need to use, an 18 gauge spinal needle with 30 or 50 cc syringe. Uh, we don't carry a spinal needle, so that's problem one. Uh, Three-way stopcock, we do have those in the cook kits. Ultrasound, we do not have in an EKG. So if we were to perform this, it would be hindered in several ways. Pericardiocentesis procedure. You want to elevate the patient's chest to 45 degrees. Identify the insertion site. It's going to be between the xiphoid process and the left costal margin. Uh, it's going to be right at the bottom of the sternum and to the left. Sterilize the site with 10% chlorhexanine. That's uh, something that hospitals carry. We don't have them on the buses. Pericardiocentesis procedure, you want to begin monitoring with the EKG. Identify the pericardium on the ultrasound. There again, we do not have it. There's no way for us to identify it on ultrasound. Aim the needle towards the right shoulder. Insert a needle between xiphoid and left costal margin at a 30 to 45 degree angle to the skin. And you advance the needle six to eight centimeters. Five centimeters in children. All right, more of it. Observe the EKG monitor while advancing the needle and withdrawing the plunger. Uh, what you want to do is put a little pressure, back pressure on the plunger like you're actually trying to pull it out as you're, as you're advancing the needle. What this does is create a vacuum within the syringe itself and if you do actually hit a blood pocket it will, it, it will help with advancing into the, into the syringe. Aspiration of blood confirms pericardial entry. Abnormal EKG patterns are observed when the needle touches the myocardium such as PVCs or an ST elevation. It's reason being we are touching it and irritating it, therefore you're irritating the heart. Uh, you want to aspirate the blood from the pericardial sac. Relief of symptoms may be observed with as little as 20 cc's removal as we stated before. You want to withdraw that needle through the same path 